that I'm going to share with you show that the simulation of floor 13, even if the side plates were it's not part of column 79, girder 82001 would still not be able to travel far enough to lose its seat support. The reason is simple. It had partial height bearing stiffeners, which stiffened the flanges of the girder, thus preventing it from failing. But NIST did not include them, and yet they were, they were there. So here are the bearing stiffeners I'm talking about. This is girder two, A2001. Here's the base plate, and here are the bearing stiffeners. They were there. And here's our model showing them. This is, the fi this is the abacus model. This is with the side plates. All that kind of stuff is there. You see, that's our simulation, the virtual simulation of the same thing that was built. That's what we did. We broke them out. This is another depiction of the NIST report showing that the bearing stiffeners were omitted. You don't see them. Another depiction from the NIST report showing the bearing stiffeners were omitted from the girder. So here's the W33 by 130 girder, column 79. Here's the W24 by 55 uh, floor beam. And so this is A2001. Uh, concrete slab, metal deck up here. Uh, this is the arrangement. Uh, again, another view. This time, no side plates. Using the NIST, you can see where it still didn't drop off the, so the base plate. It hadn't moved enough to make that happen. Yep, it was getting way too close, for sure. Another view of it. Okay. Issues that led to the five and a half inches of movement. Non-composite main girders, neglected thermal expansion of the concrete slab, separated connection modeling, and missed web flange stiffeners. I want to point out that um, I think you can all imagine, I haven't talked about this yet, but um, if, if you take steel, it has a thermal expansion of about uh, 6.5 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, inches per inch per degree Fahrenheit. If you take concrete, it's made up of rocks, water, cement, and, and, then, and, then, and the kind of aggregate and the, and the amount of aggregate is going to significantly affect that thermal expansion. Limestone, for example, has a very different uh, thermal property than does um, sandstone, than does um, dolomite, the, than does other rocks. Each one of those have thermal expansions that can be from 2 times 10 to the minus 6 all the way to 12 and a half times 10 to the minus 6, depending on what you, you're putting together with that steel. In this case, I tried to do our best to locate what the aggregate was that they were making concrete with in that area and put that into our model, okay, to simulate what was going on. Here's the comparison of the UAF NIST modeling approach. Steps taken. The floor framing, steel connectors, springs, yes, we had them. NIST had some, but not all. Ex exterior steel framing connections include springs, yes, they did not. Girder to column stiffener plates, we included them, they did not. Floor beams uh, that were composite, floors that were composite with beams, not major girders, we uh, considered them. Floor beams that were composite with beams and girders, we considered them, they did not. Thermal expansion of the concrete deck, we considered it, they did not. And thermal conductivity expansion of material properties, we considered it, and they did not. So, now, what about the NIST fires? This is the distribution of the heated up floor systems due to uh, at different times at floor 13 by the NIST temperature distribution. And we did some modeling of the temperature within the floors and came up very similar. So no arguments there, and we used these temperature distributions as part of the analysis. The UAF WTC7 abacus modeling, this is kind of what it looked like. You can begin to see that uh, this is for floor 12 and 13, not for all 47 stories. You can imagine what it would have meant to do that. We took a look at the connections between the deck and the beam, and I haven't put very much in this slideshow about that, but basically what we did is we looked at a frame insertion point, joint offset, and we then accounted for the interaction between these two when they were acting compositely. 
We then uh, looked at sample connection response. Here's a sample connection. I'm not going to show you all of them. I'm just going to show you a snapshot of what we did. Here is the model. Here is its performance steel uh, loading versus displacement. We ended up with a behavior that looked like that, and here's where it was located in the building. Then we took another one. This was the, what they call the fin connection sample, uh, where we had an interior girder going into a, a beam, W16 by 26, and we modeled it, and that was what's called F, and that's where it was located. And so we took each one of these, put them together, and put it into the structure. This is the abacus, con abacus connection model that I'm just talking about. You can see it's a shear connection. Just bolts, it's not, the flanges are not fastened to anything to resist moment there. Here's an example of it behaving. What is it, oh my gosh, it, it's actually moving, you see, and, and it has the bolts there, the shear bolts, and that's pretty much how it's gonna look. And this is the moment rotation curve for that. Despite the fact I said there's no moment, the bolts are still resisting some twist, some rotation. Okay, here's another look at what it's gonna look like if it's really starting to get stressed. Okay, shear displacement. Then what I'm going to take you to now is what we call the UAF SAP 2000 collapse computer model. This is the 47 story, three, floor three, 47 stories, including all the bracing and the framing um, three dimensionally. The structure was built on a substation down here. I didn't talk about that much. Uh, you know, I, I guess I had enough to talk about for four years and I don't, didn't want to hold you that long. So uh, we have basically uh, computer models to look at what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. I apologize. Remember that we saw a, uh, a fairly significant amount of load that um, Column 79 could take taken if we'd had a 600, about 200 degrees a C, and so 5,142 kips was what actually was acting on that structure at that day. Uh, it moved 1.92 inches to the right and 0.73 inches upward. Um, this is a composite response. What are what of our UAF conclusions say? The concrete floor beam Diaphragm stiffness is significant even with no shear connectors because there's friction between the concrete and the steel framing and it's not trivial. The thermal expansion of the concrete deck cannot be ignored and it's likely with that less than steel, the value is highly dependent on the type of aggregate. Okay, I've intentionally taken you down redundancies all night long because I wanted you to be able to remember what I was getting ready to say. The research team evaluated fire by considering the airspace below the beams and the space between the drop ceiling and the structural steel framing. I initially did not intend to do that. Our dean said, maybe you should think about that. So I did. So we did look at that issue. This, the result is that the fire underneath will likely burn through the drop ceiling quickly and its resistance to heat transfer is likely not available to help anything. The NIST vertical collapse was not consistent with that of the actual observed collapse. The difference was primarily influenced by their not modeling significant portion of the structural framing connection details. At least that was certainly some of it. So what about the actual collapse? What about this? We evaluate possible failure modes using SAP 2000. We conducted failure mechanism studies using both Abacus and SAP 2000 to ensure reliability and accuracy. What I'm saying is that we would take, there, there would people would contact and say, hey, uh, take out all the core columns and then the, the exterior columns will be, will be folded inward and they'll buckle and that's what, should, should, that's what really happened. We, 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 would, we would try it. We would try it just to see. And we could never get that to, to actually show up as, as one of the mechanisms for failure. We, we did it over and over and over again. A number of engineers said it had to be that. It, it just would not uh, be the case. We evaluated collapse for various conditions. These included failure at the substation level. That's basically a 4-3. I was concerned initially when I came into this that maybe uh, this, the support system at the, at the ground level might have been the problem. Damage imposed by falling debris from towers one and two. 
um, we examined that. Uh, did it cause a problem? It really didn't do very much damage, but we did consider it. We looked at the radiant heat from towers one and two and its influence on the building structure. Not much influence. The building response for